Today's episode is brought to you by Checkfront, the booking platform trusted by over 5,000 tour and activity operators around the world. You can start your own free 21-day trial over at Checkfront.com. You are listening to the Travel Industry Maverick Show, part of the Tourpreneur Network. Unfiltered, unabashed, definitely not sugarcoated, roundtable discussions with your hosts, travel industry veterans Peter Syme and Christian Watts. Monthly conversations with the people who matter from all sectors of the travel industry. And now, here are your hosts, Peter Syme and Christian Watts. Welcome, everyone, to the second edition of the Travel Mavericks. Today, we are delighted to welcome Roswana and Oscar, the co-founders of Peak Pro. They founded in San Francisco in 2012, so coming up on 10 years now. And they've been one of the huge growth stories, really, in the, in the res tech, in the reservation uh, software world. So we're going to try and keep away from the, the techie chat today and just have a general sort of industry chat, talk a little bit about the res tech industry, talk a little bit about what they what they saw last year. I think they had a really good year last year with a lot of domestic USA. So really interested to, to hear about that and just try and get an idea of what they see going forwards, especially for this summer, if we're going to have a season, if there is going to be a season where it's going to be and what it's going to look like, what kind of activities are going to be hot. So yeah, welcome guys on to the second show. You're the inaugural guests. Last week was just the intro with just ourselves. So you're the inaugural guests. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be part of it. Just to let you know, this is not going to be the, the Brit show. It just so <laughs> happens that we've got a, quite a few Brits. We've invited Oscar on as, as the token European this year. And maybe some point in the future, we'll actually invite some Americans or others to the show as well. Guys, if I kick off with a, the first question for you, I'm either lucky or unlucky, but Every week, and there isn't a week goes past that operators don't reach out and ask me the same question, the number one question. And the question is, how does the operator select the reservation system that they want to work with? And I've been using reservation systems since 2008, and I've helped operators select reservation system. But the user experience of selecting a reservation system, I can only describe it as horrendous. It's difficult to select a system. Now, that's not just an issue for the operators. That's an issue for the reservation system industry. So if you, if you kind of take your hats off at the moment, your peak hats off, and talk from an industry perspective, how can you guys, with your competitors, work together to make that user experience of being able to select the reservation system better for the operators? I think that's a really... Good question. It, it does come to your point, right? It comes up a lot. The recommendation that we usually give that I get, even when I meet operators in conference, and obviously we're like slightly biased towards Peak. Peak's great. It solves a lot of your problems. But the general recommendation is start with your pain points, right? Make a list of what actually matters to you. Do you need waivers, right? And then the next question is, do you want to collect those waivers up front? How important is marketing to you and how important is getting online bookings on your website uh, and, and kind of versus like, for example, OTA bookings and kind of break down your operations, really starting with, I recommend thinking about it from the customer journey, right? How does a customer find you? That's the marketing side. When they come to their website, what is the experience you want them to have, right? What do you want them to see? How does that flow into the booking flow? Once they book, what are the information that you need to collect? What are the Follow-ups you need to do, like waivers, making sure that the emails work. Then what does your staff need, right? Like, do they have the right manifest? Do they have the right information on the phone, ready to go, right? Depending on your business, if you are uh, you have different needs, if you're running a food tour, you're walking around, it's very different than if you're in a location. And then what's the follow-up? A lot of these customers, you know, they're not necessarily repeat customers. You want to drive that word of mouth home, right? So how do you follow up with them? Make sure they tell their friends get reviews, for example, so that that strengthens your SEO on your website. So kind of breaking down your business and the customer's interaction with that business, because that's what the reservation system is there for, right? Like they're supposed to help you at every step along that journey. Break that down, prioritize sort of what is the thing that you absolutely need to have? What are the things that you need to have? 
And especially as you think about COVID, right? I think a lot of these things have changed. A lot of operators that I've talked to over the last year kind of very much move very aggressively to online only. There's an operator here nearby where I live, they're on peak. Uh, so I've been in touch with them and they used to have a lot of walk-ups and they're hundred percent online only at this point. Now they might open up to walk-ups again, but that is their priority and that has to work really, really well for them. So kind of rethinking the business from that perspective, create that list and then start working with the reach out to the sales team, reach out to these uh, booking systems and ask them, Hey, here's my list of things. Demo me. How would that work in Peak or in whatever other booking system you have? And then basically pick two or three that are sort of your top choice and then do a deep dive. If you have a GM or if you have staff, get them involved in the decision-making process. The last thing as an owner is to, what your staff hates is come in uh, for you to come in and say, I want everybody to now switch to the system. And, and the staff is going to throw up their arms and be like, but it changes everything that we do and I don't want to learn something. Also, another recommendation right now, a lot of businesses, it's low season and COVID uh, last year was hard. It's a good time to look at new booking systems, right? A, everything has changed, how you interact with your customers, but also often you might not have the same staff that you had before. You might be rehiring anyway. So if you're switching now, your staff will just learn the new system from the ground up rather than like this, that switching cost is a lot lower uh, internally for your business. Yeah, I think what Oscar highlighted is great. And I think it's just really what's going to move the needle and help your business, right? And I think that you can kind of think about that in ways that you can increase your revenue and your profitability. And that might go into, you know, yeah, having reviews, as Oscar mentioned, on your own website to provide the social proof. So when people find you, they want to book and they're coming through your website as opposed to somewhere else. It might be increasing your own conversions and remarketing to people who might have been interested but dropped off in the shopping cart. It might be add-ons and upsells in the, the booking flow so that you can try to take a customer who's already interested and is converting and, and perhaps get them to be spending a little bit more because they're getting an additional service. So I think there's ways in which you can enhance your revenue and your profitability um, that, that are very impacted by the booking system that you use. And so I think that's a big component for you to think about how you want that to work. I also think it's about the customer experience. The biggest thing that matters for any business um, is making sure your customer has a great time. And so if you can do that by making sure that they're safer, so they've got contactless payments or they you know, don't have to see someone in person today in the age of COVID where, where there are concerns, that's great. That's a better customer experience. And so I think there's ways in which you should be thinking about how you can make your customer experience better and can the res tech help you and facilitate you with that. And part of the challenge is that the devil's in the detail, right? Everybody can say, hey, we have manifests, but it really depends on whether you can customize them in a way that works for your business, right? And there was a few efforts in the past of, hey, let's create a list of all the rest tech system and columns, you know, does it have feature A and does it have feature B? And usually everybody tries to check off as many boxes as possible. And when you dive into it, it doesn't actually solve most of your problems. Again, sort of little bias towards peak, but if you're an operator looking at a system, you might want to look at a few smaller ones, but definitely look at all the big ones, right? Like all the rest tech systems that have been around for five, 10 years are usually the ones who built something and then got a lot of customer feedback and made it better and made it better and made it better. They're more just more likely to be able to handle all the specifics of your business. And I think part of what you're kind of alluding to is why part of the reason it is so complicated is because there's so many different businesses and they all run their they all run their operations differently. And all these rest techs have to find ways to solve all of that. And they all solve it in slightly different ways. And so it is very hard to do an, an easy apples to apples comparison. Yeah, and the, the customer experience out to the end user, the, the customer. And most of the res techs, certainly the main ones, have all got quite a pretty good front-end customer experience. It's the customer experience to the operator, because the operator is your customer. That ability to select res tech is not a user-friendly process. It is not a customer-friendly process. It's a difficult process for the operators to do. I think ease of use is also incredibly important, because one of the biggest things I think that we've spent a lot of time thinking about is how can we make it really easy so that if you're a guide, it's easy to use um, all the way through to the owner and you're getting the information you need. And often what happens when people are building products is that they add more and more features, 
but they don't make it easier to find them and use them. And so I actually think that ease of use is actually incredibly important for an operator. And so I would actually add that as something, you know, it may not be easy to select who you're planning to work with um, and the devil's in the details, but I think one aspect that we find that people don't look as much at, but is really important is, is how easy is this to use? If you're going to see hundreds of customers in a day, is this actual you know, system and process going to work for me? And is it going to be easy for everybody in my team, whether it's someone in finance all the way through um, the accountant that I've hired all the way through to, to my guides? Can they get everything that they need very easily? Yeah, I think that's a problem you get in any software development. Isn't it? Over, over time, you add features, you get feature creep. And before you know it, it's so difficult to use. I know we go through that at Magpie all the time where we're constantly trying to add features without making it more complicated. Yeah, I think that's been a big piece for us. But I think that then it really matters that you invest in design and the product management side. We've got a lot of people on our team that focus on that piece exactly because of what you're saying. Because, you know, there's no point as adding a feature and then making it harder for someone to use the system, right? So that becomes, you know, a piece of, of constantly having to innovate on the user experience and the design piece. And I think it's been helpful Oscar won't, won't brag about it, but he's got two degrees from in engineering from MIT, but he's also got a degree of fine art. Um, so probably a little overqualified for anything anyway. Uh, he's the he's a smarter one of us. I think the fact that we have that DNA has been important to us because you really do need to think about having a design and a mechanism for, so that it's easy to find that feature and use it without getting buried. Just to make that tangible for anyone listening and kind of trying to select something, Christian, you're exactly right, right? It is an ongoing investment. You don't build the feature once and move on. Uh, every feature that you build has to be maintained and has to be rethought with every new feature that comes up and then redesigned and, and kind of keep that simplicity that Rizwan was talking about. Best test for a partner, for an operator to talk to a rest tech system about it, ask them what have they changed in the last year, right? What have they released and what are the updates that they have made not just the new flashy things, but also the maybe the redesigns or the under the hood things. That's usually a good question to ask because that'll help you understand if the business, the rest tech system is constantly investing in their infrastructure into their core features and into redesigning things to make sure that it remains usable. We've just gone through the, the, the list of rest techs and we're over 100 again. I thought we'd be down in the 80s or something, but there's over 100 that we see that are still active. And the only one that I know of that's actually gone is Easy Ticks. I don't know how many others have actually gone. There are definitely rumors of others being sort of halfway in and out. Almost 12 months into this with a lot of places on close to zero revenue. How's everyone survived? And have they survived? Are they, are they just very quiet? Are they just dormant and not developing? What do you think is happening in the general market? I think that probably is a level of dormancy. You know, um, I think folks battling down the hatches. I do think we might find that, you know, as we get into the next year, that we see that it's hard for people to get, you know, to sustain themselves long term. I do think that um, we haven't really seen consolidation in this space because, you know, aside from the top couple of players, everyone's very small. So I think, you, you know, you made a point around there's 100 players, but how many of the businesses use any of the bottom kind of 90, right? Very, very few. So that is a scale thing. So you can kind of say you might be able to be in existence, but you're only working with a small number of businesses. And over time, you're not going to really grow that base very much. And so I, I do think that what you're seeing is that there's lots of small folks out there that won't be able to scale or build, have a lot of merchants using them. And I think that, that what that means is that the, the bigger players um, who have more businesses working with them uh, are are able to earn more revenue and they're able to use that to invest more into their product. And so I definitely think that what we'll see is that even if there isn't a consolidation per se, what happens is just that people sign up more businesses and they become bigger. And in our industry, I would say we still are in a space where the reservations tech is out there, but it's still not the majority of, of what people are utilizing, right? A lot of folks, especially even larger businesses are using something that they hack together, that they, they had someone help them with, a myriad a mix of lots of different things that they they use. And so I think most of this opportunity in this space is not in trying to bring together lots of small businesses that are creating res tech, but actually in just going out and finding new businesses to use your res tech. So for us, a sales approach has been more effective. And we see that today, actually, there's a huge replatforming happening. So a lot of businesses had kind of said, hey, I'm really busy. This isn't the right time for me. But the, the slow season and, and time has been incredibly busy for us. 
because people are desperate to kind of figure out how they can do all this stuff to generate more revenue and, and, and increase their profitability. And so I think actually what you're going to see over the next few months is there's just a major replatforming. Every business is rethinking the way that they're doing business and how they can automate and how they can, um, you know, increase their profitability. And so um, I suspect we'll see that that scale difference will become more pronounced in the next year or two, even if there are players that still exist and are small. Do you think every business is replatforming or do you think they should be replatforming? I, I get the feeling that it's something everyone knows they should be doing right now. But especially on the operator side, people are just so beaten up that they're not actually doing anything. Yeah, I think that we've all felt that kind of COVID challenge of, wow, no more, right? And so I definitely, I think that, that we've heard from some operators where they're like, you know, taking a break and they they need that. I think we've also seen a huge amount of inbound and and more engagement than we've ever had in the history of the business now as well. So folks are trying to get through. Um, we, we were helping a lot of our businesses get the latest second tranche of PPP. Um, so there are kind of multiple, you know, ways in which people are focusing. But certainly in our experience, we've never had more demand for, for the software than we have now. Do you see a situation coming out of the, the pandemic when we're in operator jobs are very short of cash, if any cash left at all? The vast majority of operators who are not on res tech yet, although there is some big ones, as you mentioned, the vast majority are small, tiny businesses, well under 250K, many of them under 100K a year. Is it in their interest to go through a res tech adoption with all the complexities of selecting that res tech? Or should they just hook up with some retailers who will give them tools that are simple, straightforward, hook straight into the retailer? and keeps it as simple as possible for the user, the operator. Is that where the small operator's going to end up, or is the small operator going to end up going through this painful journey of getting on ResTech? I mean, I don't think it's that painful to, to get on the ResTech. They're pretty simple and straightforward. I think, you know, deciding between them, people might find complex, but I think to Oscar's point, there are, you know, there are only a handful that have become the most popular, so that can be a, a really easy way for people to winnow down what might be a good fit, which is, you know, what is working for the most number of merchants? Great. You know, the, the, most operators are using probably only two or three systems, right? So that means that based on your pain points, you can probably have conversations with three folks um, and pick one. And I, and I think one of the things that certainly has happened for a lot of systems has been making it really easy for folks to onboard, helping them through that. So I actually think the process of selecting and bringing someone on isn't that challenging as long as you're focusing on the right periods, but that can take a day or two for someone to do. We see that all the time with businesses that we work with. And I think it's worth doing that because actually, you know, the average business that starts working with us, then we, we have our own data is about, about a 30% increase in revenue, which is huge actually. And so I actually would really recommend that businesses, if you are able to right now, to take this opportunity to do it, because you can also start utilizing the systems and getting used to them in a period where perhaps you don't have as many bookings. So I would really encourage them to do it because I think it just helps so much in terms of being able to drive more revenue and profitability. And it's more important than ever in this period, because I think that, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. It looks like the latest data around the US, which is the market that we are most uh, deep in, you know, vaccine levels will probably hit about 50%. A July 4th weekend, and it will take into the fall to get it up to 70%. So, you know, certainly going into the summer, hopefully about half of people are going to be free to move as they wish, but half people won't be able to. And so I think it's really important for operators to take this time because actually you're going to get a lot of people wanting to do things in the summer. And how do you take advantage of that and make the most of it? Because we've had a really tough year for most folks. I'm going to push back on the vaccine thing because I always do, but we're going to hit 50% by April. We're going to have everyone vaccinated by June is my prediction. I would love that. And, you know, I'm just using the latest kind of, you know, the New York Times have been sharing things around um, the vaccine. Um, and so I'm using that as a data point. They might be wrong. If anything, if it's a couple of months in advance, that makes it even more uh, important for everyone to get ready for that and take advantage of having a huge summer. Because I think there's a lot of catch up that everyone's doing, um, having had a really challenging year last year. You mentioned there the peak perspective, your main focus on revenue at the moment is the USA. Go forward a couple of years, is it better for Peak to become the number one reservation system in the USA or is it better for Peak to be the number three or the number four global system? Where is your focus going forward? Do we want to do more things globally? I think we do. I think what we've just recognized is that there's so, much, there's so many businesses in the US that still need us. 
but it's been easier for us as a company to focus on this market and really uh, make sure that we are doing everything, you know, within this time zone and all these other benefits that you get from focus. And so we do have operators from lots and lots of countries coming in as inbound, but we will focus most of our efforts on, on onboarding merchants here in the US. But we're a global business and we, we have lots of business from, from other parts of the world outside of the US working with us. But, you know, our sales team and our efforts are probably focused on the US because we have such uh, benefits from already having so many of our businesses working and, and operating and being happy with us here. What have you guys not done well in the last few years? You bought Zozi. I don't know what year that was, but that was one of the few mergers, acquisitions. Was that a mistake in hindsight? Did that, did that actually take you back a few years or was that all upside? And what, what else have you done badly that you would do differently if you could go back? Because there's another couple of big players that have obviously done really, really well, really quickly. I think that that's a great question. I think the context of, you know, Working with Zozi, that worked out really well. Um, it helps a lot of businesses. You know, we have had these experiences in our industry where folks have had challenges and, you know, how is it that they get to the other side? And so being able to partner with all of the folks at Zozi um, to be able to bring our customers on board end up working really well. And we had some great customers who had a great experience. It also encouraged us actually to build a load of things. We are really great at rentals. So, I mean, we obviously can speak to this, but Zozi encouraged us. We learned a lot from that because we saw that, that a lot of businesses needed some of those tools. And so the Zozi partnership for us was really valuable because it allowed us to learn a lot from what those guys had done and, and incorporate that. So it made our system even better. I think areas that we you know haven't done as well, I actually think that we've been very focused on products. So just going out and, and helping merchants with their problems and solve those and, and a huge amount of our resource and efforts on that. And actually, we probably did less on sales over the last few years, right? Um, there were other companies, I think, where you know, their sales teams were probably three times as big as ours. Um, and, and they were more focused on getting folks using a system that might not be as sophisticated, but getting out there and doing that. And so I think if there was one thing I think that we learned from and needed to do more of is, is actually going out and selling the system into more operators and, and using sales as a mechanism to have people hear about us. Because I think that we had been so product led and product focused. It's almost this kind of Silicon Valley mindset of like the product is everything. Um, and we're going to make that the best and possible thing it could be. And that's to the detriment of not perhaps you, having as many folks in our team going out and actually showcasing what we do to other folks. And so I think that what we didn't do as well was probably having as much of a sales led approach and being a bit behind on that, you know. So I think that's an area that was a lot of area for improvement for us. And, you know, we've been building out, I think, well, last year also, you know, last year um, when COVID first hit, we had no idea what was going to happen. And so um, we ended up letting go of the folks in our team, um, which was really challenging because we just didn't know what was going to happen. And we, we wanted to reduce our costs and make sure that we were going to be here for years to come. And in hindsight, that was also a mistake because we let go of people. And then we had the summer, we had the biggest summer we've ever had because we were helping so many businesses move to local and get a load more local bookings. And so it ended up being the case that that growth happened and we were had a thinner team. And, you know, we're now in the process of hiring again and building out, but you know, it would have been so much better to keep all these amazing people that we have in the company that knew uh, our industry really well and, you know, we had to let go of. So I think that was also a mistake that we made. How as an industry, as we start to recover, how do we work much better using technology with other parts of the travel industry? For example, all the operators on the ground work with accommodation partners. Every operator's got its own small network of self-catering, lodges, hotels. But there isn't a technology solution that matches the accommodation sector to the rest tech in any way that satisfies both ends of that, that agreement. The, the hotels don't want to adopt, adopt their technology. We don't want to adopt their technology. And that's a huge opportunity for growth as we recover. They reach a new market at scale rather than just all these individual deals operators have to do with the accommodation. And the other part of that is a recently seen peak where recruiting for a head of business to consumer. What's that all about and how how can that B2C business tie in with where the customers are, which is staying in hotels and self-care and accommodation? I think it's a very interesting question. How do you connect experience providers with accommodations? I feel like it's a little bit cart before the horse because right now, rest tech systems don't even talk to their own OTAs that are within the same industry, right? Every single integration has to be custom built. If you're selling through TripAdvisor, if you're selling through Get Your Guide, if you're selling any one of these, resellers. And I think that makes it really, really hard because every tech system has to build against their APIs and maintain that. And we talked about earlier, every feature you build is also 
ongoing development. You don't build it once and then you're done. It also makes it really hard for new resellers to come in, right? We had a big shift into local and there's an opportunity for more resellers to say like, hey, I'm a mini OTA focusing on a very specific experience niche in this locale. I want to resell experiences, you know, in this region. They can't tap into it, right? Because all these operators are either not on a booking system at all, or if they are, they're all on different booking systems and none of them have any interest in working with this small reseller. So what I'm getting to is, right, the there's been a drive for the last two years to come to an API standard in terms of just being able to resell within the industry. Peak's a big proponent of that. Uh, there's a few other companies that are part of it. COVID kind of stopped, slowed it down. We were going to, we have a, actually have a spec. It's called Octo. It was supposed to launch at Arrival last year and then Arrival got canceled. But the spec is there. There's a few companies that are pushing it forward and they're working more directly with individual resellers to start driving adoption. But that to me is the first step. Before we get to accommodations and, and other resellers, let's actually get this industry connected in a way that anybody can actually start reselling. I think that'll open up a lot more business for everyone. How do you sell that to the rest of the industry? And in, in my view, you guys being ResTech and a bunch of OTAs kind of wreck this business by each going your own direction and, and creating your own standards and not speaking to each other 10 years ago. And that's easy to blame. But how do you fix that now? Because there are definitely OTAs that won't, that won't budge now. They think they've got their own standards and I think they've almost gone back the other way and they're going to do it their way. Part of what drove the adoption, just to clarify, has been the REST tech systems coming together because the REST tech systems don't have standards. They implement whatever the OTA's API standard is. So the OTA's come in and say, hey, we have these customers. If you want them, you connect to us. So the REST tech systems are actually in the position who have to spend a lot of engineering resources in building all of these integrations. And Part of that standard came from the ResTech systems coming together and saying like, hey, this is crazy. We're all building the same thing over and over again. Having said that, to get to your question, right, you do absolutely need the OTAs to buy in ultimately, right? I think that is something that you can't get away from. And I think what's most interesting to me is uh, there are some efforts in terms of building converters and general purpose converters that anybody can use that say like, hey, if you implement the Octo standard, these are general purpose converters available that then connect to the customized integration with Viator or with any of the other guys. So you don't actually have, even if you're a ResTech system, you don't have to integrate with all of them because these converters are available. I think that makes it easier on the adoption side initially, especially on the ResTech side. I think the more you have that standard and the more resellers are coming into the market, the more they're going to look at that, say, I'm a new reseller. I want to build something new in this industry. Do I give my own standard and fight a fight with every single booking system to adopt my standard? Or am I going to use this standard that all these other booking systems have already started to adopt? And I think that's sort of the natural evolution of that. So is, it, is that the answer Peter's looking for? That if there is a standard adopted, then the hotel down the street or the cruise line down the street can much more easily sell tools and activities because i think that's the problem it's so complicated right now for them to sell i mean that would be the dream especially there's an opportunity for people to even build businesses around that right to say like hey i'm going to take this standard i know this accommodation software i've seen this reseller standard let me build a business around connecting those two got a quick message from one of our sponsors and then we'll get right back to today's show stay tuned do you spend many nights sitting at your desk trying to figure something out in your booking system to make it work better for your business? With Checkfront, you'll always have access to a friendly support team who's quick to reply with a step-by-step -step solution no matter what you need help with. Find out other ways Checkfront can make things easier for you at checkfront.com forward slash tourpreneur. Rana, this is a question for you, and it's around the pandemic rather than around technology in the industry. Employment of women in the USA just now is back at 1980 levels due to the pandemic, and it's forecast to go all the way back to 1960 levels. Therefore, women have been dramatically hurt more by the pandemic 
than men. And if you look into the travel industry, that's probably true within the travel industry as well. As a leader in the industry and as a woman, what do you think about that? And what, what needs done to address that, that women disproportionately suffering massively more due to this pandemic than men? Yeah, I saw some of those stats as well. And it just is really scary to see, you know, in December, all the jobs lost as a net were for women. So I think you have a situation where, you know, we as a society have had a lot of women working in the service sectors and especially in things that have relied on being in person. So that might be in restaurants, it might be airlines and, you know, all of these businesses that have been the most impacted in COVID because we're not able um, to see each other in person. What actually areas where women were disproportionately providing a lot of the workforce. And so that's obviously a really sad situation. There's a couple of things that we can do. One is that as we, you know, hopefully get our society and our economy going again, that's going to be really important. So I do think that figuring out ways for us to come out of lockdowns and and some of the, the kind of rigor that we've had around that and allowing people to open up a bit more as vaccines become widespread is incredibly important because these businesses and these small businesses that include, by the way, tour operators, but also restaurants and a whole load of other small businesses really need our help to come back. And so we definitely all a, need to help them get to be open again on a political level through to um, supporting those businesses as they do. And I think the second piece is around reskilling, which is that there's a lot of people, I think, today where, you know, their skills might have been suited to something um, that was more of a of an in-person or a service oriented. How is it that we take these really amazing, brilliant, smart people who often care a lot about their customers and help them um, go into a new world, which is actually um, not necessarily all, you know, in person, but a lot of it's remote. And so what we've seen is that about 50% of companies now are saying that they want to stay remote. Um, but they're going to have some kind of work from home policy. And that means that I think there's a whole lot of opportunity for really incredible talent to get opportunities to work in those remote areas. So even if you are not living in an area that has loads and loads of of other jobs, now in the age of remote work, um, we can give people new opportunities for new careers. And I think that's actually very, very important for us to do. Women in leadership, which I don't think is probably linked to a lot of those jobs lost. I don't know how much experience you have outside of the travel industry, but is that different? Are we more progressive in the travel industry? And what do we need to do, speaking for, for three white men on the top row here, what do we need to do differently? Yeah, I think the travel industry is is similar to other industries, right? You know, we're we're living in a society where there aren't as many women in leadership. And I think that that was true, you know, in the experiences. I worked at Blackstone in the team that bought hotels. And so I've had a lot of experience around hotels as well as the activities market and, and, and tech in general and finance. So, you know, in all of those places, I would say there haven't been a ton of women in leadership. And I think there's some challenges around that given the networks and the way that people are chosen for jobs, you know, women haven't had as much access. They haven't necessarily been as able to get as much access there. And so I think it's how do you break those ceilings, make it more equitable and meritocratic for us to select people. It's also all about having lots more people in the funnel, right? Because sometimes what I hear is, oh, it's a skill set issue. People haven't had as much experience. Well, how is it that you can bring people into your organization who don't need to have too many skills, but are more likely to be diverse or women, right? And so I think it's, you know, you get great leaders because people are growing in your organization and becoming managers and directors and upwards. And so I think investing in that and making sure you're having more women in your organization, especially at levels where perhaps many years of experience isn't qualifier, right? And therefore you can get more really bright people in. And as people kind of work their way up, um, you're giving women an equal opportunity and, and perhaps even having programs to mentor and, and provide extra kind of assistance to folks who have been typically underrepresented in that mentorship. Jumping back a bit, as we all know, business to consumer businesses uh, can be an excuse just to get big piles of cash and burn them or give it to Google. Uh, whereas the scene recently you were recruiting for a heady BTC, what's the peak plan for business to consumer or are you just going to burn a bunch of cash like everybody else? Actually, our opportunity here is actually coming from what we've just seen, which is I mentioned that about 15% of companies have said that they're going to be remote. And one of the things that we found for ourselves was that we were working with businesses who were starting to move to virtual. And so a lot of our businesses are figuring out ways to be able to do experiences uh, in a virtual world. And we as a company started using them. So we said, you know, it's really hard not to see anyone in our team. And yet those personal relationships and the opportunity to have connection and bonding is really important for us to be great at work. And so we started doing these experiences ourselves. We started kind of offering these experiences 
to, you know, that were virtually led, which might be learning how to cook a great meal with a James Beard winning chef through to doing an escape room online or, or all the way through to learning how to play chess like the Queen's Gambit. And so we started doing these experiences internally, started piloting those, and we had teams from Google, Amazon, Spotify, and others using us, and they loved it. And we got into, you know, someone does it once, we'll turn around, and three months later, they've done it 10 times for their teams, and people want it as a regular way for their companies to bond. That bonding time is really important. And so we think that the corporate, you know, experiences market is going to need a lot of help. And I think it's a great opportunity for our operators who might have something that could be done virtually or that could be done with companies to be able to layer in a new part of their business to help them grow. So that's what we are seeing ourselves have an opportunity and want to focus on. So we want to hire someone to help us do that because we've got so much demand from companies wanting to do these virtual experiences. And we think that's actually going to turn into more of a habit of doing offsites. And so I think if there are operators out there that might have a way in which to say, okay, well, you know, what I'm doing could be something that I could turn into being something virtual or a way for teams to collaborate, be creative, have fun together. I think that's going to be a big market. It's already about an $80 billion market. And I think there's lots of opportunity there. And so that's what we're looking at helping with. So probably something that's a, a quite focused and something that's come from success that we've had without even trying. And so we want to put a little bit more into that because we think that's an area that could be super interesting going forward. What about the rest of the B2C, the, the sort of selling the standard activities on, on peak.com? Is that still part of the future? Well, like, we want to focus on where we have an inherent and big advantage, right? And I think that we do have a lot of that with um, what we're doing with corporate virtual. And so I think it's just being focused, right? We have got so much work with Pete Pro and all the, the cool tools and, and technology we're building um, that this seems like a really great way for us to start helping some of our businesses get new customers in a way that's unique to us. We are uniquely able to go out and find a new clients for them. And so that's what we're focusing on and we'll imagine being our focus for the foreseeable future. One of the questions that we get is around, you know, where are these bookings going to come from, right, in the next year or two, right, for businesses? And I, I do think that OTAs are not going to drive as much of uh, the booking volume for tour operators. And we saw that in the last year. We saw that the, the OTA bookings went way down for folks. And, and I think they're not going to come back that quickly. A part of that's because a lot of the people who are going to be doing things may be a little bit more local still. So I don't think travel will be quite back to the levels that we might have had in 2019. And so I think the local focus is going to be very important, which is typically something that OTAs have not been pretty poor at. You know, I also think that um, there's an opportunity for businesses to start driving more demand themselves and using their own marketing and, and, and doing a whole lot of things around that. Because I don't think a lot of folks that, you know, a traditional travel company with, with experiences as part of it or activities as part of it, they've tended to retrench to their core. So I don't think they're going to be doing as much. And, and even the folks that were spending a ton of money on going out and finding demand in 2019, I think, you know, have learned that some of that wasn't very effective. To your point, Peter, earlier, you described it as burning lots of cash. I do think that that had happened. I think people are going to have to be a little bit more thoughtful this time around. So I think that, that means that there's more on the operator to go out and find their own bookings. And that makes it very important for them to be able to be really good at marketing and, and lean into the marketing side. With regards to virtual events and virtual experiences for corporates, which I totally get, and I know several companies that are doing exceedingly well in that space, do you think that then transfers out for virtual experiences, be it its pure seat, right to the end user, the individual sitting at home and bored on a couch at night and dreaming about going to Rome or Milan or whatever? Do you think that virtual experiences are viable from a commercial point of view from operators? They're certainly there and can be done in the and from an experience point of view, they're good. But do you think they can be scaled to be commercially viable for an operator? I think we'll have to wait and see on that. I think that, frankly, connection and human experience and a lot of in-person is really important to us. So I do think there are some challenges to saying that a, you know, a consumer who, for their leisure, you know, is going to jump online and, and do an experience. Uh, I do think there's more of a scope to do it within companies and teams where you know, we are just in different offices. All of us are all over the country right now and all over the world doing this podcast. And I think that becomes a really important, valuable thing. I see it probably as being a bigger component of how companies need to think about things. And I think social activities are actually incredibly important. 
uh, for companies to have great productivity and engagement, or even with your clients, right? So when people are working with clients, what we've heard from folks is, I can't talk to my clients anymore. I can't see them in person. I'm not going to conferences. And frankly, probably my company isn't going to have loads of money for us to do more of that in the long term, right? They We're switched. We can do it online. But how is it that I can have more of a social experience? So I think it's more likely to be successful there than it is in in just the consumer side, because I I think, frankly, we all enjoy getting out there and and seeing people in real life. And we spend way, way too many of our hours online. You know, I think there is a market there, but I I don't think it's as large as it is for corporates. Yeah, I I think it's an interesting market. Operating at Hop on Up Off in in San Francisco that I have, that I've been doing for a long time, we always talked about the corporate because we sat here in the middle of Silicon Valley with all of these massive corporations, but we never really scratched the surface with them. We always went back to those easy travelers, which are the people from Green Bay walking down the street or the people from Germany or something. They were just easy. It always frustrated me. I think that's a massive potential for a lot of people in the industry that this has now opened up, that they can now reach those people virtually to start with, and then hopefully in person later. Yeah, exactly. And I think of it as just a, a new channel, right? We are talking to businesses and you know, hopefully, you know, having businesses reach out to us, we've had lots of inbound from folks that are doing this, that we might not even have known what we're doing really cool virtual experiences. This is just another way for you to get your, you know, get what you're doing out there and share your passion and love for what you're doing um, with more people. So I, I think it's a huge opportunity in an area which benefits both parties, because often those costs are lower as well. Doing a virtual tour doesn't have the same level of operational expense. So it's actually can be very profitable for businesses to start introducing that if there's a fit and there's a passion and interest and they enjoy doing it because they've already got the most important resource, which is an amazing guide or a host to do it. Virtual is here to stay, but it'll change a little bit. I think the question coming back to profitability of virtual tours, it really will depend on sort of how the market turns out. I do want to give a little plug for Shane and his Tourpreneur podcast because he's had a whole lot of really, really good people on the podcast. I listened to it. A lot. So it's been really interesting to hear from the people who have succeeded in virtual and why. There hasn't been a very consistent story other than fully commit yourself and don't underprice yourself. Don't don't offer it for 10 bucks. But I think we're still at the infancy of that. I think it'll be interesting to see how that comes up over time. But yeah, I think for anyone looking, I think virtual should be a part of a business. I think it is a new channel, as Ruzwana said. We'll have to watch the market, sort of what is the right thing to do and how to be successful. I think all of that is still being figured out. I do think uh, corporate as a whole is an opportunity for operators, not just virtual, but in real life as well. If we look at the situation at the moment, many operators are going to not get the international clients that they need and had in the past for quite a considerable period of time. Local corporate businesses are still uh, around. There's a market I know well, previous to the financial disaster in 2008, well over two thirds of my business was driven by corporates. And corporates are actually more profitable than international tourists. If you get the right relationships, we had every single bank in the UK signed up pre-2008. So they are a very good B2B customer that gives you repeat business as well. So it's not just a one-off hit that you often get with an international customer. So they can be really good business. One of the opportunities I see for operators as we come out of the pandemic is all of these corporates have had all these people distributed around the world sitting at home working on technology. And yes, there's a safety thing about when they bring them back together, but they're probably more likely to be willing to bring them back together in an outdoor environment with smaller numbers than put 2,000 of them back in an office. So definitely an opportunity for operators to create products suitable for corporate groups from small groups of 10 up to groups to 20, 20, 30, delivering real products probably in the outdoors in the early days until the corporates catch up with their safety protocols and what they're happy sending them. But that, that is a new market for many operators that has the potential of replacing their international customers. Exactly. And that's the reason that we found, you know, we've got so many great relationships. So, you know, with so many of these big companies um, that have offices everywhere. And that's why, you know, we said, hey, we want to do more of this because we do have these great relationships. These corporates are already coming to us and saying, we want to find things, help us find fun things for our teams to do. And we're also looking at the future where in the next few months, those guys want to do offsites. And so that is exactly why we're leaning into it and adding folks into our team around it, because we do have a great head start on helping businesses to tap into this opportunity. Back on the, the B2C angle. So, and I had a conversation with one of your early salespeople back in the early days, a guy called Mike Berman. And we were actually looking for a different system. And one of the problems I had back then was that 
you guys were pushing quite heavily on the B2C, on the peak.com. And some of the resellers had a problem with that. I don't think any of them do anymore. But where does that sit on this conflict? Because you, you're trying to play this middleware with this res tech, which is peak pro. You've got this front end peak.com, which does compete. I know you haven't been pushing it as much over recent years, but it does compete with the OTAs that you're trying to work with. It's very similar to some of the conversations we had last week. You've got Kluke now talking about making tools. So they're coming over to your market and you've got KK Day released Resdio. And there's a couple in Europe that play both sides as well. So can you play both? Is that allowed? Is that sustainable? Our job is to help every tour operator have the best experience they can possibly have in running their business and getting new customers, right? You know, to, to Peter's point earlier, they're our customers, right? And that's who we focus on. Our job is to get and do as much of a good job around helping reduce pain points and helping those businesses. One of the big themes that we've heard from operators is they both need amazing software and they want increased profitability and they want a whole lot of things that we can help them with. And so, you know, as an example, we started helping operators collect verified reviews. And the number one feature that we've had, you know, over the last few months has been um, us letting people use these verified reviews on their own website, right? To create social proof so that they don't have to rely on other channels to capture reviews, that they can get these verified reviews on their own website that can help them drive SEO and also can help them showcase that they're really good at what they do. That was something that we heard. Reviews were important to operators because it's a way in which they're getting new customers. And so the more that they can potentially start having those on their own website, the more the likely they are to get a conversion on their own site. In an age where international travelers will be lesser, we saw that last year, so this year, we've been helping operators think of new ways to do that. And so that helping them get more locals because we've been really good at doing that. This isn't really about what's the best system for what OTAs care about or others. It's about serving our customer. And, and I think we should continue to invest in every single tool we can and every single way to make operators' lives easier because it turns out it's really hard to be a tour operator. It's, it was a hard job before, but it's even harder and made even harder with COVID. And I think you'll see other companies are doing more along these lines. It's just about how much value can we create and where can we assist. Another way to think about it is, right, like, A, as an operator, you know, you can choose to be on peak.com, right? Like, you can opt out. It's like nobody's forcing anyone. But having that inventory for us on peak.com allows us to actually go to drive the corporate that we just talked about, right? We have inventory where we can say, hey, Spotify, hey, Amazon, here's inventory, you know, that you can use now with your teams. If we don't have that inventory, we can't help you get those bookings. And if you get them through other channels, that's great too. But if we see opportunities for these, we kind of want to help drive those. If we see opportunities that other people don't see, I think that's, to Ruzwana's point, that really ends up helping the operator overall. It is a risk though, isn't it? Because Kluke got the same argument, just to throw Kluke, they're easy to pick on, but that's their same argument. They're trying to serve their customers and they think there's a gap that they haven't got the res tech in Asia, so they're going to build the res tech for them, which is fine. But you are in this path now, if you're, you're going to be in the same space exactly as the OTAs, you're all going to have the same tools on the, as far as the software and as far as distribution potentially. It makes it a lot more competitive. We've come at it from an operator-led point of view, right? So I think that we've invested a lot in tools. These reservation systems are different. And, and I think we've been at it since 2012, like you mentioned, right? We've been building these systems. And so I think we've got an incredibly sophisticated set of tools that are incredibly expansive. You know, folks do need to focus on having the best technology that works for them. And so I think we're going to see more probably of this. You know, there's going to be more opportunities for companies to start doing it. I think going into the reservation software when you haven't built it before, I think it's more challenging because you haven't necessarily had an, an insight of working with thousands of operators over many years around what they need and some of the improvements and iterations that Oscar mentioned. And that's going to be a very important part of it. So, you know, with the software, I would say it's a backbone of, of, of an operator's business. And that means there can't be any room for error. And so that's why I think we've focused so much on that over the last few years, because that's that's the core of our business. I think a lot of your operators' main pain point as we come out of this is, it's very simple, it's getting new customers is going to be their main pain point. There was many operators, particularly city-based ones and big tourist destinations, were over-reliant on OTAs. They've seen that disappear overnight. They're not seeing it coming back even when they got some traffic. So... Their main pain point is acquiring new customers to allow them to get some cash flow to rebuild. So when you get down to these strategy is pretty simple. Anybody who executes better than anybody else on really difficult things normally wins. 
So if operators are struggling for customers, and that is their main pain point, that I believe it will be coming out of this, certainly some operators, maybe not all operators, there'll be some that will do very, very well because of the product, and that's just luck. Anybody who positions themselves to not just provide technology, but provide customers, it's got to be a strategic advantage and it's going to keep operators happy. On that note, what would you recommend for operators, especially we're talking domestic this year. I think everyone is settled on domestic being the majority, whether you're US, Europe, especially, I think. When I talk Europe, I think intra, intra Europe. What do you think operators can do better for this year? I think that it's really important for operators to focus on driving their own demand. So I think, Peter, you're you're completely right that this is going to be an important situation where, you know, taking ownership matters. And so that means that some of the things that people might have been wary of doing before, which might be having a great system with marketing tools that allow you to be able to develop your own campaigns and track them um, very easily so you can see what's working for you. I think things like Facebook and Instagram and Google ads, you know, those paid acquisition channels are something, especially when they're um, catered towards locals, it's going to be really important for operators. And that might be because you're using a marketing specialist or you're working and using some of these tools. We do a lot of webinars and workshops around how to be able to do this and, and pivot into local. We did that last year. We're doing more of it this year. So I would say driving demand yourself and getting a little bit more ownership around that is going to be really, really important. And it's going to be a a huge way that operators can really succeed in this period. Because I think actually locals are going to want to do things much more now than ever. And what we've seen is that the idea of a local is not even, you know, it's not what we traditionally thought of. It's, you know, not a few miles. People are willing to go even 100, 200 miles away from their home and go and do an activity for the day. And so, you know, rethinking what it means to be local and attracting those people and having campaigns that are specific for those people and maybe even doing email marketing to customers that you know are in that area um, as well as doing you know any kind of like content marketing that you want to do we've seen some of our operators start investing in some of these things like instagram and seeing that they can attract locals so i would say heavy local and and, and focusing on driving that demand what are the red herrings there so you know google adwords i think everyone agrees with Facebook advertising, I think, is a slam dunk. Instagram starts getting marginal. Is TikTok just a bit of a shiny thing right now? I mean, what's a waste of time? I think operators can spend a lot of time learning about the next thing and then realize it was kind of just a just a cool thing to do at the time. So I think that um, sometimes you get really big benefits of being really early on platforms that are new. You know, TikTok's quite big now. And so if somebody's looking to kind of engage there, it might be a little late in the game for you to get the kind of traction for the amount of work you're going to do. But but I think watching out for these new channels and these new opportunities, these new social uh, networks that might exist and getting in them really early and leaning into that is actually worthwhile doing. So I would say that I think, you know, maybe the boat might have passed a little bit on things like Snap and TikTok. You can still do them, but you've, you've got to be aware that you're going to have to make a decent investment in order to make that work. I do think focusing on the core, like Facebook, Instagram, and Google is actually worthwhile. And I think actually Instagram on activity specifically has been, you know, probably it has a mixed result for, for certain things, but on, on activities, it seems to be having some success. But, you know, Facebook and Google are definitely your best bets. The vast majority of operators, unless they're scaled, just haven't got the bandwidth to deal with all the channels to market. Therefore, my advice always to operators is pick two where your customers are and make sure where your customers are there and just double down and hone them to, to the best possible way they can be and have a small presence on the rest, but don't freak out if you're not getting business from Instagram or TikTok. Or just go where your customers are and become really good at operating where your customers are. Exactly. You've only got so much bandwidth. You know, focus on the, the big stuff. And if you're really passionate about it, if you love doing this, then maybe if there are new things that are emerging, you know, dive into those when they're very early, which, you know, is scary to do because you're not sure of the payoff. But as those grow, they can have big benefits. There's a new there's a new tool now that's an audio network called Clubhouse. And the people invested on that very early were able to get a lot of benefits. And so um, I definitely think that uh, the earlier, the better on these things. Yeah, and I can help. If anyone's looking for Instagram help, I've got my um, Instagram page, Dad Influencer. I can help. I've got 150 followers. I'm trying to get up to 180 by the end of the year. So if anyone wants me to spread the word, I'm happy to do it paid influencing work don't you have to change that dad influencer to granddad influencer at some point (laughs) not yet hopefully i've got a few more years yet before that before that comes along as we wrap this up guys time to make some predictions i think i've seen a prediction this morning from the board of 2a2a global size big company 26 million customers 
the CEO predicted by the end of the summer they would be back to 80% of 2019 levels. I thought it was completely off his head. So what's the prediction in percentage terms? Where's the industry back to by the end of the summer? Are we talking global or are we going to pick on some markets here, Peter? Uh, both if you want. Our industry is so large and expansive, especially since it's so global and, and how international travel is going to evolve is a TBD. I think still over the next couple of months, we'll know a lot more. But I would say that in the US, I believe that you will have activities bookings, especially along the smaller activities being bigger. You know, so I think outdoor stuff like water sports and, and things that are in small groups will be back to way bigger than 2019 levels. I think we will still see some some of those kind of museums and large attractions um, struggling though. And so I think that, you know, you won't be seeing those guys hitting 2019 levels. It is really um, going to be a very different story for different segments and different verticals. And the more outdoors and the smaller you are, um, the bigger a year you're going to have and the, the, the quicker that's going to come back, especially for the summer. And hopefully you'll get that summer season. For bigger folks where it's a lot of indoors, I think that, that you're going to really uh, be waiting until the fall, which is typically not a good season. And so, you know, it may be into 2020. Uh, two for those guys to to be able to really come back. I think the locals is going to be the safe bet. I think that's definitely happening. I think we've seen that last year, and I think that's going to continue to happen, especially as people are still nervous about COVID. Anecdotally, literally every person I know has been planning their post-COVID vacation for the last year and a half. They know exactly where they're going to go. They Some of it is in the U.S. They want to see family members they haven't seen in a year. They want to go abroad. I think there's sort of like, there's a chance of a peak of all of a sudden COVID is safe, people feel safe enough, enough traveling happens, and all of a sudden it builds enough momentum that probably more towards the end of the summer, but at some point all of a sudden travel is back for just, just that pent up demand getting out there. I wouldn't plan for that. Uh, I think that's a dangerous thing to do. Again, it depends a little bit how this year pans out, but again, it's sort of anecdotally, I've seen too many people being like, I just can't wait to go traveling. Hey, thanks very much, guys. On that note, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Really appreciate uh, you guys coming on the show. Best of luck for everything this year for you and your operators. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.